Good morning, Pastor Mark Driscoll here from Oakdale Free Methodist Church uh, in Jackson, Kentucky, and I'm glad to have you here this morning. Uh, we're going through the book of Colossians. We're in chapter 3, um, talking about, uh, today we're talking about God's building project. In fact, today and tomorrow, we're talking about, now here's the reality, is that God has a vision uh, for his purpose in your life. He's got a vision for his own glory. He, he wants to display his glory in the earth. And so he does that through his people, through his church. He's done that from the beginning of time. And um, as, as we read the scripture, and it calls us to a life of holiness, and it calls us to a life of obedience to Christ, if, it helps us to see that God is not just imposing rules on us so that he can have us under control, but that God has a vision. God has a kingdom vision for the earth, for his church, for your, your personal life, for your home, your family. And if I can get in touch with the vision God has for me, then I see holiness and righteousness, obedience, um, not as this cumbersome burden that I have to carry, but I see them as tools in the hands of my creator who is making me into his image because he has an eternal purpose for me and for everyone in my life and for everyone in the world. And so uh, as we look into that vision today, I want you to get a vision of what God wants to do in your life and begin to say, how is God calling me to fulfill that vision? But let's pray and then we'll get into it. Father, uh, thank you for your ho holy word. <clears throat> Thank you for your faithfulness to us today. Thank you, God, uh, for saving us from our sin and giving us a destiny, giving us a purpose and a calling, a high calling. Thank you, Lord God, that you have called us to be the new humanity in Jesus Christ. And you called us to reflect your glory in the earth and throughout all of eternity. And Lord God, our lives are not incidental. Our lives are not just uh, blips on the screen of eternity, but our lives have intrinsic value, depth of meaning and purpose. And God, sometimes it's hard to see that in, in the life we live and the things that are happening in our lives. It's sometimes it's hard to see the value in it. And so, Lord, I pray you'd open our eyes. Help us to see today. Help us to see clearly, Lord, your calling, your purpose, and your power that are in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As, as Paul is writing, he's getting into this vision of not only uh, what Christ has done for us on the cross and in his resurrection, but now he moves into uh, how do we live, what, what does that have to do with a larger purpose? What is the, what is the purpose of God in our life? Um, anyway, let me, let me start off saying it like this. You know, um, I, my wife and I have been married almost 34 years. And just about every house we've ever lived in, in fact, every house we've ever lived in, has been a, on some level a fixer-upper. We've had to uh, remodel, we've had to restore, we've had to change, and, and that's, that's a good, we kind of enjoy that. At first, I honestly, when I first started trying to uh, do that, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know a hammer from a screwdriver. And I, I didn't know uh, how to do a lot of the things that I do now. I, I've done my own wiring now, I've done, I've put up drywall and things like that. I've installed equipment. I've, I've done framework. I've done plumbing. I've done it all. And uh, not, to, not to brag, but to say over the years, I've had to learn these skills. When we first got started, I didn't know squat. I mean, I, I, I knew which end of the hammer was supposed to hit the nail, but I couldn't hit a nail worth anything. And uh, people used to be amused and concerned whenever I got into a project because uh, I really didn't know what I was doing. But over the time, I've changed. Over time, um, not only have I learned how to do these things, but I've lived in some places that have become quite beautiful. But here's, here's the way God has brought me and my wife, or my wife and me, together. And uh, she's the visionary. She is the one who can look at a piece of junk on the side of the road that, to me, just needs to be hauled off. She can look at it, and she can see something beautiful that will go in our house. And she can see what it will become. Uh, every time we work on our house, uh, every house we've ever lived in, she has a vision for what it's going to look like. And I, and all I see is dirty, wet drywall. All I see is nasty, wet carpet that needs to be yanked up. I see plumbing problems. I see, you know, those kind of things. But she's got this vision for this house. And, uh, you know, uh, what I've learned to do over the years is just uh, trust her with that vision 
and do what I'm gifted to do to see that vision take place, right? And uh, we 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 live in a in a place that I it's not a fancy house, but it's beautiful, and and we've taken a lot of old things and renewed them and restored them, and we've built this home. And so, the reason I'm sharing that with you is because uh, God is is working on a project. He's not just trying to save us and control us and take us to heaven. God has a has a vision for all of eternity. And his church is a big part of that vision. This morning I was reading, and uh, before I get into Colossians, I want to look at, briefly, at uh, three different passages of Scripture. First, in Ephesians chapter 2. Um, well, let me just tell you what it says. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is talking about the church, and he says, you know, we're, we're now part of the household of God, and we are built, we are being built to be a dwelling place by the Spirit. We're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets in order that we might become a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. And so what is God doing with his church? He's building us to be a place in which he dwells. Um, and then in, in uh, 1 Peter, it says that you're living stones. I'm a living stone, and we're being built together into a holy temple of the Lord. And then in Revelation chapter 21 Starting at verse 19, there's this beautiful description. And this morning, as I was just reading it in my, uh, in my devotions, something uh, I was struck by the wrong way I've, I've read this passage for years. Let me just read just a few verses out of Revelation 21, starting at verse 9. He says, Then came one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like the most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Then there's so much more here. But whenever I used to read that passage, I always thought, well, that's the that's the, the New Jerusalem in heaven. And I'm not saying it isn't, but what did the angel say at the very beginning of this vision? He said to, to John, Come, I will show you the bride the wife of the Lamb. And then he describes this beautiful, beautiful city with 12 foundations, which were the apostles, right? The apostles formed the foundation of the church. And then it has all this beauty. And I'm not going to go into the artistry and, and all the symbolism of all the stuff. There are people more equipped to do that than I am. And, and that would be a fascinating thing. But, but I want you to see that what John was seeing was, was not just a city coming down out of heaven. It was the church. It was a metaphor, a, a grand a picture of the church and her beauty and her radiance and her power, her majesty and, and all the beautiful stones and the stonework and the gates and, and all the high walls and, and all this beauty and, and majesty. Go back and read it sometime and just to get a vision of it. But here's my point. My point is, is that he was showing John the church, that God's ultimate vision of the church is for him to have a place in which he dwells. God wants to dwell in his church, and he's, he's cleaning her up. He's making her holy. And according to Paul in Ephesians, and according to Peter, um, he is building this church over the centuries throughout history. And even with all of our mistakes, even with all the the foibles of history and, and problems that you see in church history and things that, that have gone wrong and things we haven't done quite right. And, and then there have been times of revival and times of falling away and there have been times of obedience, times of disobedience, that God has been faithful to work on this habitation, this dwelling place. And you see, God wants to dwell in his church He's building a project. He's building that his people, you know, God dwells. People always say, you know, the church isn't the building. Uh, it's, the, it's not the bricks and the mortar. Of course not. 
it's the people. We're the church. But do we ever really think about what that means? The Apostle Paul said it in at least two other occasions. He said, don't you know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit and that God dwells in you? You see, what I want you to get today is a vision that God doesn't just want you to be a religious person who is well-behaved. God wants you to be a dwelling place, not only individually, but corporately. We, the church, are the dwelling place of God. Now, we're all very individualistic around here, and so we're, yeah, I know God lives in me, and he's in me, and I'm in him, and, and that's true. It's great, but I want you to get a bigger vision. God's not just in you individually. God is in us. We're, a, we're the corporately, worldwide, over 2 billion people who believe in the name of Jesus worldwide, one-third of the world's population and growing, and we are a habitation, a dwelling place for God in the Spirit, that, that each part doing its work, each one being a living stone in the building, every one of us, and we work together to become this beautiful beautiful dwelling place. And so here's the thing I want you to see, first of all, is when you look at the future of the church, I want you to have hope. You see that Revelation picture of the church is not a defeated, worn out, backslidden, horrible, dead, pathetic bride. It is majestic. It is, comes down out of heaven. It is glorious. It is powerful. It is beautiful. Even in time of persecution, even facing the, the Antichrist and the beast and all of those things, facing the things of this world and, and the onslaught of the devil, the onslaught of the enemy, the church just grows in beauty and glory and majesty, even in the midst of storm, because God has a destiny for his church. So whenever every generation or so, you get a few people who want to say, you know, the church is on her way out. The church is done. And it's funny, generally speaking, about the time people start saying the church is out, that's when God steps on the gas pedal and accelerates the, the holiness and glory of the church. Now you're thinking, what in the world does that have to do with Colossians? Well, Paul uh, begins by, you know, in chapter 3, he's trying to get us to line up with the purpose of God. He's trying to get us to get ourselves in line with what he's doing. You know, if my wife and I are working on the house, and I'm trying to tear down wall, drywall while she's saying, you know, what we really need to be doing is working over here on this other project, then, then uh, but I'm, I'm all stubborn and want to do what I want to do. And then sometimes we've had those issues, and, you know, she's, she's got this plan, and she says, you know, it really needs to look like this. And I'm thinking, oh, now, yeah, but I want to do this. See, I like this, this kind of construction I like, this kind of construction I don't like, so I want to do what I like. I want to do what I want to do. And then she'll say, well, okay, honey, if that's what you want to do. And then I, two hours later, I'm thinking, you know, I should have listened to her. I should have done it. You see, because I got out of step with the one who's got the vision. Here's our, here's our problem as, as Christians today is that, that sometimes we're so caught up in what we want to do. So what we want to be and what we think is important that we forget that we're called to walk in step with the one who has the vision. We're called to walk in step with our creator, our redeemer, our, our guide, our master, our king. So because he has the vision, he's got a direction that he wants to go with his church. That's why the church needs to be a praying church. Not that we're going to, not just so we can ask God to pull down heaven for us, but so that we can say, God, what are your marching orders? God, where do you want us working today? What do you want us to do today, right? And so here's the thing. Paul starts off, we read yesterday in verses 1 through 4, where he said, look, if you're risen with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above. In other words, he's saying, look, now that you're part of God's construction team, right? Are you listening? Now that you're part of God's construction team, get focused on the project. Get focused on what God is doing. God is interested in doing things of eternal value. God is interested in doing things that will last forever. Now, we have a lot of pet projects that won't last for six months after we're done with them, but God is saying, look, get your eyes not on the things of this earth, but on the things of eternity, because if you'll do it, if you'll pray like I tell you to pray, if you'll obey like I tell you to obey, if you'll love like I tell you to love, if you'll forgive like I tell you to forgive, 
things are going to happen. Great things are going to happen. It's interesting that we're, we have so many people praying for revival now, but the problem with praying for revival is that we're still wanting revival on our own terms. We're saying, okay, now God, here's our strategy for changing the world. You've got to get this candidate in office for us. Come on. You've got to get these laws passed for us, and you've got to get things working for us because here's what we think should happen in our world today. Instead of being what the church was in the book of Acts, when they would meet together, look at Acts 13, 1 through 3 sometime, and their leaders would get together and pray and seek the Lord and say, God, what are you doing? God, where are you leading? God, what are you calling us to? And so the more we do that, the more we'll see God at work. Now, now what he, go, he goes now in the next section that we're reading in today, the Apostle Paul is talking about two things, and we're going to talk about one of them today and one of them tomorrow, Lord willing. In verses um, <clears throat> 5 through 11, he tells us what to tear down. You know, when you're going to build a house, when you're going to restore a, a building, you got to tear out the nasty stuff. You know, the thing I hate the most is going into an old old house and tearing out all that wet, nasty drywall, ripping up wet, nasty carpet, uh, tearing out old plumbing that's no good and full of grunge and gross stuff and, and trying to get all that kind of stuff out of the way. Uh, you know, I have so many horror stories I can tell you about having to tear out all the old stuff, right? But here's the thing. If I don't tear out the stuff that's dead, there's not going to be any room to put in the new stuff, right? So in verses 5 through 11, he tells us to tear out the old stuff. And then in verses 12 through 17, we'll get tomorrow, he tells us to build in the new stuff. You see the point? And so if I can, here's the thing. If I can see my life as part of God's project in the world, then I, instead of saying, uh, God, what can I get away with? I'm going to say, God, what is what do I need to tear out and what do I need to build up so that I can line my life up with your purpose? Too often, we're trying so hard to get God to line up with our purposes that we're not paying attention to his purpose. That's why Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, his blueprint, his strategy. Then all these other things will be added to you. And some of us today, that's the, that's the simple choice we need to make. I need to stop trying to drag God into my project and start saying, okay, God, what's your project? Now, so Paul starts telling us about tearing things out. Now, let, let's go ahead and read. I've been building up to it. Now it's time to read. Look at verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, he says, put to death. Therefore, in other words, tear it out. When you talk about putting something to death, you're not talking about compromising with it. You're not talking about playing with it. You're talking about burying it, having the funeral, reading the eulogy, being done with it, saying goodbye, right? Put to death what is earthly in you. Wow. Can you think of that statement, what is earthly? You see, you and I are not called to live as earthly people. We're, we live on the earth, but we're not of the earth. You hear what I'm saying? And so that's a cliche, but we don't really think about it very much. I remember years ago, Back in, I guess it was the 80s, I just heard a clip of an old country song on, on television. And I never, didn't listen to the rest of the song. But I heard this first clip of it that always stuck with me. And it was a woman singing to God. And she said, Lord, I'm a Christian, but I'm a woman first. And then I guess in the rest of the song, she is singing about her lover or whatever. And, and I think, you know, actually that's kind of not the way God calls us to live. God doesn't call us a leader and say, now, God, I'm this first, and then you're next. No, we seek first the kingdom of God, right? we got to tear out some old stuff. Well, let's talk about what needs to be torn out. He said sexual immorality, impurity, passion. Now, that means being led by your emotions. It doesn't mean you can't be passionate about anything. But when I'm led by my passions, I'm led by my desires. He goes on, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which has been renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there's not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, vaccinated, unvaccinated. Oh, I said that by accident. But Christ is all and in all. Here's the thing. 
as I was reading this, a lot of times when I read this passage, I'll go down it like a checklist. Okay, am I doing am I doing sexual immorality? Am I doing malice? Am I doing anger? And how, you know what I want to do today instead? I want you to look at it as a whole picture. Instead of let's go down the list and make sure I'm not doing any of these things. Now there may be a place for that. There may be a place for you to really pray through it and say, God, am I am I living in sexual immorality? Am I living in idolatry? Covetousness means wishing I had what somebody else has and and, and, and hating them for having it, right? And so all those kinds of things, anger, meaning holding a grudge, uh, wrath, um, violence, malice, hateful feelings, all those kind of things. When you look at the big picture, what is that showing you a picture of? That's showing you a picture of the way the world operates. The world operates on sexual immorality. The world says, look, if it feels good, do it. If you have an attraction, that must be who you are. And so just go with it and don't judge me. And, and if it's impurity, that means I don't really have to be devoted to anything. I can be a little bit this and a little bit that. That's impurity, not being fully devoted. Passion, being led by my feelings and my appetites. Not that you, it's wrong to have appetites, but being led by them, right? And so on and so on. Evil desire. Just, you know, there are things that we want that are evil. Um covetousness, idolatry, anger, wrath, malice, obscene talk. I'm amazed at the number of Christians who feel like it's okay to talk filthy, that somehow it makes you feel like you're, you've are you got some kind of super handle on the grace of God because you can use, use foul language and evil speech. But the Bible has never stopped telling us not to speak with obscene talk. So there's all these kinds of things. But when you look at the big picture, that this is a picture of, of someone who really has no regard for honoring Jesus Christ. This is a person who really is not dead to this world, but they're dead to Christ. This is a person who will who will lie, cheat, steal, do whatever they've got to do to get what they want because it's a self-directed life. And so instead of picking at each of the things, now maybe later you need to do that, just go down, God, am I doing these things? But here's, let's get the big idea. The big idea is a picture of someone who is no different from this world. You see? And I've got to tear out those things in my life. Jesus talked about it in a really violent way. He said, look, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now, boys and girls, please, don't take this so literally that you're going to go butcher your body because, logically speaking, you'd have to remove your brain because your brain causes you to sin. Get the point here. The point is to get rid of, to violently remove anything that you know is not of God in your life. Guys, we're talking holiness here. Now, there's two approaches to holiness. One approach is, well, God will get mad if I do this, so I better find a way around it. Or I better find a way to do it without really doing it. You know, like the person who, instead of saying a cuss word, they'll use a different word to substitute it. But guys, the, the evil intent is still in your heart, you see? And so, but, but the other way to look at holiness is, I want to plug my life into what God is doing in the world. And I want to be a fit vessel for the glory and majesty and power of God. And I want to experience God's best for me. You know, I, I read last year, I was praying and thinking about what sin is. You know what sin really is when you boil it down? I mean, we can talk about self-centeredness. That's true. We can talk about rebellion against God. That's true. We can talk about alienation from one another. That's true. But you know what sin really in its heart of hearts is? Sin is the refusal to, to live for what God has for me. In other words, sin is settling for less than what God has created me for and called me to. That's true. You know, if I just want to be happy, I'll just do whatever it takes to make me happy. But if I want to bring glory to God, I'm going to live differently. You know, a person says, I'm going to live with my boyfriend or girlfriend because, well, I'm happy and, and it makes me happy and I love them and I want to be with them and I don't want to do the marriage thing. And, and so I just want to be with them and I want to be happy. But, but see, what God wants for you is for you to, to know the beauty and power and love and majesty of being in a covenant relationship 
with your spouse for life and to understand that even through the hard times, even through difficulties, there is a beauty in that that reflects the glory and purpose of God. But people look at me and roll their eyes and say, well, I don't care about that. I just want to be happy. That's your problem. You don't care about it. That's the problem. You see, that's what sin is, is you really don't care. You really don't care about the things of God. You just want to get by and do what you want to do. And then, but you want to go to heaven too. You see, isn't it interesting? I, I want God to leave me alone until it's time for me to go to heaven. What are you going to do when you get to heaven and you have to spend time with God all the time? You see, here's the thing. It, it's counterintuitive to think I don't want anything to do with the things of God in this life, but I want to go to heaven and spend eternity with the things of God. That's not even intelligent. And that's not consistent. So here's the thing is there's a heart problem. So when you look at this big picture, look at, at, at what this kind of life is. It's a life that says, I want to be my own God, and I really don't care about what God is doing around me, and I really am willing to settle for less than what God wants for me. And so here's the thing. That's why people will cheat and lie and steal, because they want to take a shortcut to happiness rather than take the long route to obedience and faith and fulfillment and joy and peace because the truly fulfilled life Jesus said it like this he said I've come that you might have life and have it to the fullest you see the purpose of holiness is not to make you miserable the purpose of holiness is to make you whole he wants to take those broken places in your life those broken relationships in your life and he wants to make them right he wants to make them whole he wants to make them healthy but what I've got to do before I can get that see when 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 we go back to the house image when my wife and I are tearing out old stuff out of a house, it can get cumbersome. It can get old. I get tired of stepping over piles of, of nasty stuff and ripping things out and, and trying to do all that kind of stuff. But then I step back and take a minute and, and I remind myself of this vision of what our house is going to be like when we get done. And over the years, I've begun to change. You see, over the years, I've begun to say very quickly, honey, to my wife, what do you want to see? What do you see here? What do you want to see happen? And then as I'm working and I got the hammer and I'm ripping out stuff, I'm getting a vision of what it's going to look like when it gets made new. You see, that's the way holiness is. It's that God doesn't want you just sitting around uh, behaving until you die. He wants you to get a vision of that you are part of a holy dwelling place. You are part of a holy temple that God himself is dwelling in right now and that God will dwell in for all of eternity and he's invited you to be part of that he's invited you to be part of this glorious beautiful project that is such a massive project it even involves renewing the entire earth that even earth will be transformed by the glory of God heaven and earth will be united in Jesus Christ and then what a beautiful eternal picture that will be you and I will be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ that's why in 1 John it says, Beloved, um, how great the love of the Father is for us that we should be called the children of God and such we are. But, we shall not, but we're not what we shall be. For we sh when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In other words, the vision is that one day you're going to be just like Jesus in faith and love and compassion and virtue and power and authority and strength and wisdom and all the things that make him who he is. You're going to be like that. Now, his character is going to be your character, right? And then, the, but the Bible says in that same chapter, in verse 3, it says, Everyone who has this hope, the hope that I'm being made in the image of Jesus, uh, purifies himself. In other words, they rip out the nasty stuff. Rip out the dead stuff. Friend, getting rid of sexual immorality is tearing out a lie. Tearing out a lie. Sexual immorality is a lie that says I can, I can use sexuality any way I want to find fulfillment. That's a lie. You're going to rip that lie out. Covetousness says, you know, if I spend my life being greedy and wanting what other people have, greed is good and it can help me be successful. If I just have, I want what the other person has and I keep trying to keep up with my neighbor and make sure I have the same kind of stuff they have and, and I get mad at them if they accomplish more than me and I live in this spirit of, of anger and hostility and, and then I get into that. You know what? That's dead stuff. That'll kill you. That won't give you hope. That won't give you peace. That'll just make you more miserable. And, and then we go on to things like 
obscene talk. I'll say what I want. I'll say it however I want, whenever I want. But friend, every time you do that, not only are you tearing down the people around you, but you're tearing down your own soul. You're tearing down your own character. Your words are like battery acid on the soul. When you speak evil, evil becomes a part of who you are. And when you speak blessing, it becomes a part of who you are. That's why Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. You see, I want to live that kind of life. I want to live the life of joy and peace and fullness and wholeness. I want to live a life that's a bright light for others. I want to live, be light in this dark world. I don't want to blend into the darkness. And so we have all of these different things. Um, you know, people say lying. You know, lying's okay if it gets you what you want. We well, you know truth is so much more beautiful. And God calls us to be people of truth. He doesn't call us to be liars. And so there's so many different things. And so Paul, he finishes this up. And he's saying, look, uh, Christ is all in all. You see, there's the vision. There's the ultimate vision. And so I want you to get an idea, get a vision of what God's doing in your life. So today we're just talking about ripping out the old stuff, ripping out the dead stuff. Let me ask you this question. When you go down this list and it says, put these things away, let me just ask you to say, is there anything I need to tear out? And, and tomorrow we'll get into what I put in its place. Listen to this. He says, sexual immorality, impurity. That means when I'm pure, that means I'm 100% devoted to something. But impurity means my motives are mixed. Uh, passion, in other words, being ruled by my emotions. I'm glad you have passion. I'm glad you got emotions. But don't let them run your life. Evil desire. It's not okay. It's not okay to, 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 to have evil desires and nurture them and dwell on them and think of them covetousness that thing which is idolatry the worship of things um, are you so caught up in in the possessions that others have or the opportunities that others have and are you so greedy for those things that it's running your life anger you know we all get angry but having anger is different having anger is living in anger some of you are living in anger. Some of you, anger defines you from the moment you get up to the moment you go to sleep at night. And then you lay awake in your bed because you're so angry and you're thinking of all the people who've wronged you. You're thinking of all the things that you don't like about life. And you're thinking of all the stuff that's unfair. And you're just boiling inside and you're just living in this boil. And then it leads to the next one is wrath. Are you a violent person? Are you a person who... And sometimes he, and we brag about it as Christians. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to let them have it, right? Wrath doesn't always have to mean extreme violence. It can be, wrath can be um, when you're cursing in traffic. Wrath can be when you're um, expressing bitterness and anger toward a server at, at a restaurant or a, or a store. Wrath can be uh, being hateful to your neighbor. Slander. Well, malice. Malice simply means ill feelings, evil feelings. Who do you hate? Who do you hate? Come on. Slander. Slander is, is talking terribly about people. And, and, and uh, destroying somebody's good name with things that you say about them. Obscene talk from your mouth. Filthy jokes. Filthy curses. Then he says, do not lie to one another. And he goes on to dwell on this. He says, don't lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices. In other words, guys, you, you got rid of that. Stop lying to each other. Stop telling yourself it's okay for you to lie. It's not. So let me ask you this. This is just a short list. This is just a short list. This is, these are samples of the kinds of things that can accumulate in our lives. So as you're praying, I want you to seek the Lord and say, God, not only from this list of, of, of short examples, but Lord, is there anything in my life that does not bring honor to Jesus Christ? Here's a different way to look at sin. I'm going to wrap up with this. A different way. Instead of looking at sin as, oh, these are the things I can't do. Because then when we look at it that way, we'll spend our lives trying to find a way to do them. What if I said sin is anything that brings dishonor to the Lord Jesus Christ? 
or what what is it how does this is this action this attitude this habit is it helping me become more like Jesus Christ or is it contradicting my closeness with him you see then see it becomes a different way of looking at it I'm not just saying oh what can I get away with I'm saying what's really best for him and his glory and his kingdom what's really best God's best for my life you see so let's look at it differently. Tomorrow we're going to talk about what to put in its place. You know, you tear out all the gunk. You tear out all the sin and all the evil, all the wickedness. you got to replace it with something. you got to put something new in it. And so tomorrow we're going to talk about the new stuff that goes in that new house. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for your love and your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, Lord God, that you call us to a higher level of living. You call us, Lord, to be the holy dwelling place of God, that we are people in whom you live and move and operate and speak and think and act. And Lord, we need to, to be people who are desiring to walk with you. Lord, help us to get our minds, our hearts in step with you. Help us to get our lifestyle in step with you. And help us never settle for anything less than your best. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Go in peace.